Hello, my name is Kathy Harley, and as the CEO of Nurses Specialized in Wound Ostomy and Continence Canada, I would like to welcome everyone who's participating in this webinar, Manage Edge of Healing, Revolutionizing Wound Care with Negative Pressure Wound Therapy Innovations. This continuing education webinar will review patient-centered concerns in dealing with acute and chronic wounds with traditional negative pressure therapy, wound therapy sessions, and will highlight the innovative Renesis Edge to improve patient outcomes and will share patient experience using this negative pressure wound therapy system. Um, the format of this webinar will include two speakers, and we will have a few interactive polls and a facilitated question and answer session at the end of both of the speakers. And so if you could please um, put your questions in the Q&A uh, area at the bottom of your screen instead of the chat, we would greatly appreciate it. And then we will go through each question and uh, give you the opportunity to get an answer from one of our speakers. Um, I would like to thank Smith and Nephew for their support of this education. It's really important that we have continuing education sessions and it's through uh, companies like Smith and Nephew that make this possible. And now I would like to introduce our two keynote speakers. Amanda Loney is a certified NSWOC who has also completed the IIWCC program. She has been a community-based nurse and an educator for 25 years with a focus on the tri-specialty of wound, ostomy, and continence. In her role at Bayshore Home Care Solutions as a, and as a private consultant, her passion and expertise shined through. She is a national conference keynote presenter and has published in an international wound care journal. And I know that she is also a mountain bike racer. Mm -hmm. Our second speaker is Mr. Dave Elder. He is a principal systems engineer at Smith & Nephew Advanced Wound Devices Research and Development. He has a BEng in Electrical and Electronic Engineering and a Master's of Science in Systems and Engineering Management. He led the technical development of the next generation of negative pressure wound therapy products. He's got 30 years of research and development experience. Uh, he's associated with the Institute of Engineering and Technology as a chartered engineer, and he likes to sail, ski, and repair classic cars. And so I would now like to turn things over to Amanda. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening on this. I'm not sure where the weather is all over Canada, but definitely here in the Toronto area. It's a beautiful day. So thank you for joining us. So just a little disclosure, I am uh, being compensated for my time here this evening to help educate. And uh, so we'll go on to our learning objectives. And I think we kind of reviewed some of those. So I'm not going to, to go on it anymore. And we'll just uh, to go on with a polling question. So I kind of want to know, I can see everybody saying hello from all over Canada, and that's fantastic. And I just want to know, so we're gonna have a polling question, your area of practice. So how many of you are, are practicing in acute care, uh, community care or home care or in a clinic outpatient clinic setting in the community versus long term care, or you're an administrative role or other. So if you can go ahead and click there. So I'm not sure if we're seeing the results. Okay, Amanda, we have 100% have answered. We have 21% in acute care, 62% in community care or home care, 16% from long-term care. We have no one from an administrative role and 8% in other. Okay, great. So um, lots of acute community and, and a little bit of long-term care, and I'm really happy to see that. Um, as I do support long-term care. So um, it's good to see that they're they're here um, getting the education. 
So um, now that we look at um, how often do you use traditional negative pressure systems in your setting? So we want to know how often you're doing that. Often is is it daily or, or somewhat daily? Rarely, maybe once a month, sometimes maybe once a week or once every other week or never as in traditional negative pressure, it is available, but you never use it or it's just not available, five. And if you, I mean, myself, I practice in different areas. So I know uh, that in, in one area, let's say long-term care, it's rarely used or, or almost never. <laughs> um, community care, we use it a lot. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what, uh, what everybody is looking at here. Okay, we have 100% who have responded. 19% that say daily. 24% say rarely, 48% say sometimes, 6% say never, and 6% never because it's not available. Okay, so we got a, we got a mix. We got a mix in there. Okay, that's good to know. So thank you very much. Okay, so um so we look at most of you are using it like fairly often, at least, you know, once a week or so. And I'd have to say in my practice that we do use it a lot. I do use it a lot. Um, and I think if anyone's ever heard me talk on it, I do uh, have uh, see the benefits of that. So that's good to know. So I'm excited to actually go on and, and review with you some of the reasons uh, why this new innovative product has uh, kind of really hit home for me and uh, made a big difference in care. Okay, so let's move on. Can we advance to the next slide? There we go. Okay, so um, in today's challenge, the demands of traditional negative pressure wound therapy, it's growing quickly. And I think it's growing for numerous reasons. It's growing because A, there's, there's an abundance of literature that's coming out now. Uh, with the support of its use in multiple multiple different areas. Um, where I think traditionally when it first came out, we were using it for only the really big, heavy, heavy drainage wounds. And I think now we know that there's a lot more uses for it for a lot of other wounds. The prevalence of chronic wounds is increasing. I think this has got a lot to do with our, we're living longer. Um, and with living longer, we have other things that come along with it, such as cancer, um, a treatment that's associated with those cancers, surgery, radiation. So we're seeing a lot of those types of wounds as well. Um, and, uh, and when you're looking at that, our nurse's time, we, as our wounds get more and more, our, our nursing time and our nursing pool is getting smaller and smaller and we're getting stretched farther and farther. When I graduated numerous years ago, it was like, you couldn't find a job. I think I had three or four part-time jobs because I just couldn't get a job. And so in this day and age, it's like, it's a nurse's, it's a nurse's haven. They can do what they want. They can go where they want. And often this is leading to nurses jumping around, trying to find out where their niche is, where they like it. Um, but it's also, we're having a big shortage. So hospital budgets, they're not keeping pace due to increased care demands. I know that, uh, you know, getting a hospital bed in there is very difficult. We're shipping people home a lot quicker. Need to, and, and, and in order to, to address those issues, we need to improve the efficiency uh, by changing to a simpler system of care. So 65, six, sorry, 6.5 million patients in the US are affected by chronic wounds. And I think we see, this is what I see a lot of in our community setting, because that's where a lot of them are treated. Wound care cost Canada at least $3.9 billion annually in direct costs. That's pretty mind blowing. So if you're kind of looking at trying to um, provide more cost-effective care, um, this definitely is your site to look at. So let's move to the next slide. So when we're dealing with more complexity, more administrative, more time away from your patients, um, traditional negative pressure wound therapy is always people cringe at it. I know that our nurses cringe at it when, I, when we're gonna put the patients on it because it's very time consuming, it's complex to put on, it's complex to deal with. When I get those referrals in that people want to put negative pressure in, I know that that referral in itself is gonna be much more time consuming, making sure that I do the, the actual assessment for the negative pressure, 
putting in for the supply equipment that comes from a different place, getting all the different supplies in, in, in the home or in the clinic setting. So it definitely becomes a, a time um, eating thing that happens uh, when you're looking at negative pressure and it's a resource intensive thing. So you have multiple people involved in getting someone set up on negative pressure. A lack of generalist nurse confidence means uh, traditional negative pressure provisions often fail. And it, it, it always then falls back on me. So if, if nurses aren't feeling confident, then I get the call and then there's more pressure on our specialty. And I'm not sure how it is in the rest of Canada. I know that from talking to you at conferences and stuff like that, I know that everybody is really, really pinched and the specialties are in, in a big demand as well. So when our time gets utilized too much, then that takes away from a lot of our other patients and getting to other consults. Okay. So when, what challenges do you experience or see with traditional negative pressure systems? So if you can just respond this in the chat and we can um, take a look in the chat what your responses are. So what challenges do you experience or see with traditional negative pressure system? Does anybody put stuff in the chat? Okay, supplies, leaking, time to the complex, sterile. Um, I can't see all these. Actually, I can't see them all. Difficult area to cover. Nurse capabilities, the leaking is a big one. Hard to keep a seal. Um, intimidated, difficult areas, multiple wounds. Um, leakage is a big one I see. Uh, difficult for patients to problem solve. Lack of confidence. Near stomas, those are always challenging. Okay, so we saw a bunch of those things and, and I, I look forward to kind of showing some of my case studies on how we have addressed some of those things. Okay, um, unit is very heavy. And again, leakage is a big thing and difficult to, uh, to seal those leakage. Okay, so what are your patients' comments or concerns about traditional negative pressure system? So let's move on to the next one. So what are your patients' comments or concerns about traditional? So what do your patients have to say about it? The noise, yeah. And I'm not sure that's necessarily the patients. Often it's the spouse or the person next to them. Noise and comfort. Yeah, noise is a big one. Uh, cumbersome, the wires, comfort. The size of the machine. Carrying machine, alarms, tubing. No freedom, machine is heavy, comfort. Noise when going out in public. They like to see the fast progress, so the up, position. Okay, so I, and so one of the big things that I get in, in, from my patients, and I guess I get these a lot with, with those patients that are in the community setting that are coming to a clinic. So these are really mobile patients that are going out, that are able to get themselves to the clinic. And one of the big things that, that I get from my patients is the smell is a really big thing. So with our pumps, oh my gosh, the smell is horrendous at some times. And then people um, get confused whether this is the problem with their wound. Um, yeah, so that's definitely a big thing that we that that I see from my patients. So patient center concerns: device may be noisy, interrupts sleep, and everybody said that. That's a big one. And this is often why I get patients uh, and or their spouse or significant other turning off the pump um, because they don't like the the noise or they're trying to pile pillows and stuff on top of it. Stress associated with the alarm. So um, you know concerned about when that alarm goes off, what do I do with it? How do I troubleshoot it? Knowing what the, why the pump is alarming, troubleshooting those alarms. It's big, it's bulky. Um, it doesn't sit very well next to you. Um, lots of hose, this is a big one, lots of hose. It is a tripping hazard. This is a patient concern, but it's also very much a concern that I have for my patients when I decide to put them on negative pressure, whether I think that it's going to be a tripping hazard, whether they can actually carry it safely. Um, when you're dealing with elderly patients and often they have a lot of other things going on. Sometimes they have drains, urine bags, they're using a walker um, or, and or a cane. So lots of other things. 
patients removing the device if they go out. And everybody talked about this, it's big, it's bulky, um, and, it, and the, the hose dangling. What if the alarm goes off while they're out, while they're at work? Worried about the battery going dead was another big one that we had issues with. Um, odor, if being utilized for a few days, and this is where I talked about the odor being a really big problem. Now, clinician concerns, um, we get this a, a huge amount. It's difficult to use. Setting up the machine initially, um, often nurses kind of say, I don't know how to set up. If it's already set up, I can go in and change the dressing. Getting the pressure settings correct if it's not already set on those when they come, or if someone decides if I give new orders to change a pressure, continuous versus intermittent. So um, we actually know through studies that intermittent is, is gets better outcomes. Um, so whether to use it, how to set that up, why connectors, that's another uh, kind of thing that you have to be able to manipulate on the device. Dressing application, changing settings if you get new orders, troubleshooting alarms when patient calls in. So often the nurse on call will get the patient calling in saying, hey, my pump is alarming. And then the nurse trying to get at the bottom of that, what the problem is, um, the underlying cause of that, never mind even being able to troubleshoot to solve the problem is actually knowing what the problem is. Um, the time to learn. So often when I do education for our new nurses, often we get a whole like education session all on its own dealing with negative pressure. So it's just not a quick fix. It's not, you know, this is how you use this dressing and it's really simple. Uh, often this can become uh, quite an involved endeavor on how to actually um, put on negative pressure and manage the machine. So it's very time uh, consuming to learn. It's big, it's bulky, lots of hose dangling. And this is why I say a tripping issue can be a problem. Okay, so uh, challenges for clinicians. We talked about, so what, what do companies do when they, when they want you to use their product and they know it's a good product and we know that we have the statistics behind how well it works. So now a company wants to know why aren't you using it? So they collect this data and then they're looking at um, how can we actually look at improving what the issues are around usage of it. So we talked about all the, the patient concerns and the clinician concerns. So this is where um, they actually look at the statistics. So Dave, I'm gonna, David, I'm gonna drop this over to you. Sure, thank you. Great. So yeah, um, my name is David Elder from, from Smith & Nephew as a, the principal systems engineer. Um, and I'd just like to, to say that, that Smith & Nephew is not new to negative pressure at all. Um, Smith and Nephew started out in World War I making wound dressings for troops, and since then we've been continuously delivering innovation. Um, and you've seen the timely here since 2007, we've been launching negative pressure products, and every two years or so we bring out a new product. And we do this because we're always trying to innovate our technology, and we learn by gathering the needs of our clinicians and patients. And our goal is really to simplify the use of NPWT through innovation. Uh, and the great news for all the participants on today is that Canada is going to be the first market to launch our new device. Um, and I'd really like to introduce that device to you, if I could. But before I do that, um, I'd like to tell you how we got to designing our, our, new, our new device. Next slide, please. So what we do is we, we, we thoughtfully interviewed globally to understand the voice of our customers. And we go from surgeons to biomed engineers technicians, patients, clinicians, payers, all these people, and we, we gather the feedback from them. And we put all this feedback into categorized themes, as you can see here. So for example, um, we, we then translate that into engineering speak for, so an example is uh, we got a quotation from a patient and they said, I just knew it was cumbersome and a pain in the behind to have on because you had to go to the bathroom with it. If you had to walk, you had to walk with it. And that was a quote we got. And how did we translate that? Well, we turned that into the device can be transported and set in place easily. And that becomes a requirement of us to, to be able to design this device. We then categorize these things together into what patients want. And they really want to alleviate the burden of living with a wound. And then to a clinician, um, if you go in there, that's it. And they want to leave the burden of caring for a wound. And finally, for health organizations, they want to streamline maintenance for higher utilization of the device. And once we get all these assets and the requirements in place, then we start to develop and we test our product. 
and go through wound model testing, safety testing. We generate proof that shows the designs meet the needs of the patient and the, the clinicians and the operational folks. And then we do a regulatory submission to Health Canada, for example, and get clearance to launch a device. So that's generally how we go through the process of innovation. Next slide, please. Yeah. So a few numbers for our products. So it took us four years to develop it, one year of which was just listening to you as, as, as customers. We had one global pandemic. I'm sure we can't forget that one. 20,000 hours of testing for our, our new device. We had up to 40 design engineers working on the product and 10 different design partners to create this device uh, that, is, that is here. So I want to introduce this device to you. We call it the Renesis Edge. And this is a little video of which we've made to, to introduce it to you. Great, thank you. So that was a bit fast, so we'll go through a few of these points, but just to say that, that last year we, we had an innovation tour, the prototype device, we went to these, these locations here, you can see Toronto, uh, Ottawa, uh, Halifax and Vancouver, and we spoke to um, general surgeons, to, to uh, plastic surgeons, frontline specialist nurses, and we listened to their concerns, which were, as Amanda mentioned, your staff turnover, the thought of the NPWT is, is quite complex, to, to operate, they're looking for value. Um, the, the, the other thing that we're looking for was ease of, of use, uh, reducing maintenance, the device to be small and compact and improving canister features even. Um, uh, and, and all this feedback we gathered was really useful to help us to fine tune our device before we launched it. So David, I just got a funny story about ease of use mm -hmm. or small and compact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When negative pressure first started, way back when I first started kind of they I had a rep come to me and said she's like hey I've got this new compact like portable negative pressure <laughs> system and I was like oh really and she's like yeah she's like so she wheels out this big suitcase I tell the story all the time I was like I laugh at how far we've come because the initial one was it was actually you put the whole thing in a suitcase and then you oh, wheeled the suitcase behind you so I think yeah that's a <laughs> Amazing story. Uh, yeah, we have improved a lot. And it's actually quite hard to tell the scale of this device from the pictures. People think it looks a lot bigger than it is, which is why on that on that, um, on that that video that, that we had to put it beside an apple in a book just to give an idea of scale, because it is a lot more compact than you appreciate. So if you look at some of these, these uh, the pump features that we put in here, we tried to make the design look simple and importantly, not, not intimidating uh, as well. Um, we've got a sleek black trim on, on the top of it, and we have this hidden until indicators and a display. Uh, the design actually is intentionally there to hide the exudate. You see from the front and the side, you can't really see the exudate at all. It's only from the rear view that you can. Um, we have a, a really easy canister release and attach mechanism with that, that button in the front. There's an integrated carry handle because I've realized that people need to carry this device around with them. Um, but other innovations apart from the pump, um, we have our soft port, uh, which is a against the wound and that of course is very soft, doesn't have hard components in it to make it comfortable for the user. And there are a quick, quick connector to allow the user to easily change out the canister. So these are some of the features. We also have an NFC sensor, which I'll talk a little bit more 
about later on. Next slide, please. Great. Now, as you'd expect um, from an MPWT device, we've got two modes, continuous, and of course that is just setting therapy it, and the device runs with it. And you have all these pressure set points between 25 and 200 millimeters of mercury. Um, and then we have intermittent modes um, where you can see you get, you get high and low pressures. Um, I wonder, Amanda, if, what's your clinical perspective on, on this feature? Yeah, so we know from studies that the intermittent mode actually gives us better, uh, quicker granulation, better granulation tissue. But often what the, the issue historically uh, with the intermittent, and we saw everybody pop up with all their issues with maintaining their seal and getting their seal, lots of time with that intermittent, what happened was, is that the, you would get the suction going full suction. And then when you get the, the, the uh, pressure turning off, then the actual, you would lose all the suction and the drape would pop back up and the, and the black foam would pop up and then you would lose your seal. And often it can be very painful when it was, when it would turn on and then turn off. And so what the intermittent on this machine allows us to do is actually to set that, that low pressure so that you can have like a higher pressure, let's say 125, and then you can set your lower pressure, um, you know, maybe at 10, um, or 40 or something along those lines. So you don't actually get the whole dressing losing its, its suction. And then you don't risk that losing your seal and or you don't get the pain associated with that on off section. So um, this is a new feature for me because our pumps that we currently use actually um, doesn't have the intermittent where we can actually set the low end. So and so therefore, typically we never use it. So um, knowing that statistically we will get better outcomes if we do use it, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to be able to try this in the future. Great, thank you so much. Debbie. Um, this is our canister design and, and we call it a smart canister. Um, and it's got several features I'd like to talk to you about. One is an integral O-ring. Now that doesn't maybe seem to be too, too fancy, but our previous product, that O-ring used to be on the device itself not in the canister and it meant that that o-ring would wear out over time and that caused it to have to have annual maintenance because we put the o-ring onto the canister now it means that the, the the device doesn't need the annual maintenance at all so that's a good innovation we've got a dust filter just to prevent any contamination going into the pump and then the next layer down we have this innovative odor filter which is made from coconut fibers and that really helps to reduce the smell dependent upon the infection of, of the wound and again, because that odor filter has changed, every time you change a canister, it's far more effective in what it does. We then have the primary filter, which essentially is keeping the exudate away from the pump. The good thing about that is one, it's a bacterial barrier, so it keeps any bacteria out from the rest of the, the, the exhaust, but it's also recoverable, which means if you tip the device on its side and then put it back up again and, and fluid maybe has gone against that filter, as soon as you write it again, the fluid comes off the filter because it's oleophobic, and that means the pump can continue to operate. So that's a good innovation. Uh, and finally, we have this sensor and that's the smart part of the canister. And in fact, there are two legs hanging down there. And when fluid touches both of those, that's when the device triggers a canister full. And as you can imagine, all those parts assembled together inside the cap of, the, of this canister unit to make it a, a smart canister. So and that's right. Now I think over to Amanda to, to see some of her case studies. Yeah, so just on that last kind of comment about the canister full section, I know that with our old machine and with old machines, we used to, there, there was that gel pack in the inside and we used to kind of have to tell patients, you know, when you first get that, you know, shake yeah. it down so the gel pack goes to the bottom so that it doesn't yeah. burst up by the sensor and give you that false uh, reading that it's full. So um, in the way this pump actually sits kind of nicely, rather than lying down or having to hang it, um, you don't end up with that problem nearly as often. Okay. Thank you. So moving on. So this is my first patient that I got to, to be able to try. So they asked me to try this pump and I'm always eager to try new things. And so I'm like, get a call. And uh, one of my nurses said, Hey, I've got this, got this patient and he's got a, a stage four pressure injury to his coccyx. The ulcer is a good six month old. He was just discharged home from hospital after a, a really prolonged stay there. He lives alone. He's an elderly gentleman and he has a walker. Um, the wound, uh, as you can see, it's a fairly good sized wound. So about five and a half by five with a depth of one centimeter. And he did have some undermining 
of up to three and a half centimeters. And we did note a little bit of bone area there. And he had been treating for, he had been treated in the past for osteo. So the drainage was, was pretty large. Um, and so, you know, typically this is a fairly, a wound that I may consider using a disposable negative pressure like a Pico, but due to the large uh, serous with a little bit of purulence, it was not appropriate at this time for the Pico. So I thought, oh, perfect, my first case study. So I, I go in to see him, I look at his wound and I'm like, okay, yep, it's appropriate. And so I'm, I'm pretty excited. So I'm like, okay, so I, I go out to my car and I grab the pump and I get the dressing supplies and I come back in and um, I go to turn it on. And I'm like, oh, and to boot, to just a, a little rundown is I didn't actually get like a review of the pump at all. And I didn't spend any time reviewing the pump at all. I know when I met with the rep and she gave it to me, we were talking about other things than the pump. I probably should have been listening about the pump. But so anyway, I pulled this pump out and I'm going, how hard can this be? They're telling me it's super user-friendly. So let's just find out how user-friendly it is. So I try to turn it on and it's dead. And I'm like, oh, there's nothing's lighting up. And I'm like, oh, I should have listened. She told me that they normally come charged, but lem it's probably not charged. So I plug it into the wall and I'm like, do his dressing. So I put on his foam dressing, do all my measurements and stuff. And then I go to see if it turns on again. And I'm like, oh, it's not turning on. So I'm like, okay, not to worry, I've got another pump in my car. So I run back out to my car and I pull in the second one and I'm like, go to turn the second one on. And I'm like, it's dead too. I'm like, okay, th there's gotta be something going on. So it, we're gonna talk about all the kind of tutorials that go along with this canister and how easy it is, but all the kind of the, the, the pictures that you can see, you can use your phone. But I have to tell you that the manual that come with it, and I never look at manuals, um, I opened it up in two seconds, I realized the toughest part of this whole machine is actually turning it on. And that is the fact that I didn't actually anticipate the on button. I was always looking at the big orange button that you'll see there is the on button. That is not the on button, it is the pause button. So the on button is in the bottom left-hand corner and the manual told me that very, very quickly. So I was super pleased that I didn't have to like rip all that off and leave. And after that, I have nothing but ease to say about it. So we went on and we actually took, um, you can see here, this gentleman used the pump for um, about a week here. This is a week photo. He did have it on for approximately three weeks and we actually had no issues. So I passed this off to the nurses to do the change. I did not give them any update. I just said that there's a new pump in there. I want you to go in and tell me what you think about it. And so I didn't, I said, there is a manual if you need it or whatever. And um, I didn't have one call from any of the nurses saying that they had any issues with it. The pump stayed on the whole entire time without um, issues. So it was definitely simplicity of use. Um, and one of the nurses actually told me that they used the NFC sensor, which I didn't even know what it was, to be honest, but now I do. So the NFC sensor is one that you can just put your phone over top of it and it will kind of run through all the things. And he actually only did that just because he was curious, not because he actually needed to. So it kind of goes to show you that if you've used negative pressure, now I'm not saying a nurse that's never used negative pressure is gonna be able to go in there without any issues, but definitely if you've ever used negative pressure, um, and even the nurses that hadn't used it in a very long time had no issue um, using this pump and I gave them no review of it. So that went over very well, except for the on button. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. That's a really good story. Yeah, so a really designed edge with simplicity at its core. You see the edge there has got a larger canister. That's what you would typically use for a highly exuding wound. But here are some of our, some of our claims. Easy to use, intuitive user-friendly interface, and on-screen guides with step-by-step -step instructions. And really we want it to be ready for use in under five minutes, that, that's the intention. And also we have alarms and alerts in the system. So it's gonna, it's gonna uh, automatically adjust its pressure to overcome potential leaks. It gives you audio and visual alerts if a potential problem is detected and easy to follow on-screen tutorials. And that gets the pump back into action quickly. So that's the whole ethos of what we've done to make this simple.
Yeah, I'm, so, and I'm not sure, like, I mean, some people think of, of a regular phone and an iPhone and people say, oh, iPhones are really super user friendly. <laughs> and so I kind of think this is like your elite iPhone type of thing where everything is very super user friendly, kind of like talks you through everything. So even when I turned it on, it talked me through all the kind of what I needed to do to set it up. I didn't have to like go looking for something. It just, it just flowed. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, we worked very hard on that user interface to make it work like that. You'll see here in the on the, the the screen you have tutorials. So we have one for pretty much everything you could ever imagine. You've got a way to lock and unlock therapy, um, how to service the device, cleaning it, what happens if the canister is full, what happens if you get a block or a leakage, or if the pump is running too hot, and um, what happens if you've left it paused for too long, or if you have a low battery, and um, if you have a system, system fail, which hopefully you don't, uh, or if the canister is missing. There are tutorials for all of these situations that both the patients and the clinicians can use so that they can, they can familiarize themselves with how to operate this device. That's okay. Right, yeah. So when we're going on, so now I'm thinking, okay, user-friendly, how user-friendly is this? I know that our, our nurses in our community that have been out there we use a lot of negative pressure and so a lot of them over time kind of have that knowledge based on how to use it so now i wanted to test kind of like how user friendly is this i'm going to actually now use this in a long-term care facility that has never used negative pressure in their long-term care facility so these are all nurses this was uh, new to so this case um, was a gentleman and he had four stage um, actually i think one was a stage three but four pressure injuries that were very large. So you can see kind of the measuring tape beside that. We're looking at that one was was uh, like almost like 15 by 15 there. You can just see there. And then the other photo there was uh, a hip. So we had these uh, kind of uh, two very large draining copious amounts of drainage uh, for this for these wounds. Um, and the nurses were doing their dressing changes um, sometimes BID, um, and that was in relation to just the dressings would become so saturated that just in turning them, the dressings would come get lifted off. And so the, the amount of frequency was very high. Okay, so in and, and long-term care facilities, I mean, a lot of the issues here is that you do have staff turnover, you have uh, agency staff coming in, lack of wound care knowledge is, is huge. Um, and they're always really super concerned about the cost. Um, and so we get a lot of questions about that. Okay, so this is what I did for the residents there. I wanted this to go well, but I also didn't want to, um, you know, handhold them in, a, in, in any way that I wouldn't be able to do going forward. So what did I do is actually, I, I did go there the first time and I gathered as many of the nurses up as I possibly could just to go over wound care. And it was basically, I was giving them wound care because he still had a lot of other wounds to go over with them. And so it was a wound care kind of um, educational thing. And it wasn't just about negative pressure. So I was kind of working that all into it. So we provided a hands-on demonstration. I did leave them with the photos, step-by-step -step, uh, application. And you can see here, I did leave them with a little kind of trick. I know that I always function on my own 90% of the time. And so sometimes, you know, having a big piece of foam on there and trying to get the drape on there. So a little, a little trick is to secure your foam even just with a little tiny thin piece of drape first. And then that way you can position your foam. And sometimes you may use more than one little uh, piece of the drape to secure your dressing. And that way I know my foam's in the right place. And then I would go ahead and put the drape on top. You can see here, this gentleman did have a lot of undermining. So we can go to the next photo. Yeah, and we can see that he had a lot of, uh, we can't really see, see, but you can see uh, all along where that tape measure went, he had a lot of undermining up there. So I did uh, pack that with some of the Curlex gauze up into there. And then I put the black foam over top of the whole wound. And you always wanna make sure that whenever you have anything that is packing into your tunneling area, that it connects with your black foam so that it can wick away that fluid. So you can see here after one week after initiation of the edge um, that we can see a, an extreme difference in the wound bed. So the wound bed looks much healthier looking. It's a, it's a brighter granular tissue. We have less necrotic tissue. Um, the dressing changes were now being changed every three days. So that's huge compared to every two, like twice a day in some cases. 
Um, so the nurses were really, really happy. We didn't have any issues or they didn't have any issues with leaks. Um, so they never had to put the therapy on hold because I really wanted to know this. I wanted to know, you know, if they were if they were spending the time and the effort to do this, was it actually working or were they were they putting this on hold because some nurse, you know, something happened and then they would just put it on hold or put a conventional dressing on. So everything went really, really smoothly here. And uh, again, he did have all these multiple wounds. And when I was in there doing the education, I said, OK, we're going to start with one. And when you guys feel comfortable, then we will move on and we will add. So when we look at, at this uh, wound, so you can see here, so no issues. So why not? And this is where you're going to bring in the, the Y connector. Okay, so here we go. So this was, you can see the coccyx ulcer is your first photo there in the middle. And over to the far bottom right, that is the hip. This is also a very large ulcer. So we're looking at at least probably, I don't have the mentions down there, but you're looking at least like a 10 by 10 uh, or even greater. And it did have a um, significant undermining lip as well. Um, so we started the Y connector. Now I did have to tell you that the Smith and Nephew is fantastic for providing education. So if ever I have new nurses, um, I'm putting it into long-term care, and I know that there was a new nurse that was actually going to be initiating this that didn't see my in-service. So I've only have ever had to ask like once and they move, like they go way out of their way to get there and support um, your nurses if it need be. Um, so I have to say that they did go up there to help support the nurse with the Y connector. Now they, um, the rep did get back to me and said that she really didn't have to do anything. They actually just kind of stood back and watched and just gave the support as um, they did toggle through and get the Y connector to connect. So I did say you'll have to go on the machine and make sure that you um, put the Y connector that you were using that. And they didn't have any problems with that. So um, yes, yeah, so we initiated the second one. Um, and you can see um, as we go down, um, so we'll go to the, to the next one. So I did kind of want to know whether they were actually telling me the truth. I mean, you know, so I was a little <laughs> bit skeptical. So I'm like, hey, can you send me a photo of your activity summary? And so here they go. They sent me the photo and, and I can see, you know, that they're actually getting really good wear time um, and that they're they're keeping this on all the time. And so that was fantastic. And that was one of the reasons I'm like, OK, let's let's keep going with this. So when we go to the next slide, you can see that not only is this a simplicity to use, and, and this isn't this presentation isn't about kind of all the, you know, all the different uses that you can use negative pressure, but just the simplicity and the fact that it actually works. And here you can see that um, for five weeks we had this on. We had significant undermining to start, um, and our undermining had had uh, closed up. So we only had like 0.5 at the 12 and three o'clock. We have a much healthier wound bed. And if you look at the edges, they're flattening down there. Um, we're having much improved depth, managing our moisture. This was huge. So we're every three days, we haven't had to have any kind of issues in between. Um, they decrease the dressing changes. The time in general to do care for this gentleman has decreased substantially. Now they still had other wounds to do, but now taking these two out of the picture, um, if anyone's doing wound care on these big ones, they know that it takes a long time cleansing them um, and getting your dressings on and having to do that sometimes twice a day um, can be significant. The drape in itself and the way the actual foam sucks down, it's not um, bubbled up. So when you have very heavily draining wounds, often you have to stack some of your dressings to be absorbent enough. And then when they get wet or you turn a patient, then they, the shear just like lifts them off and then you end up changing it. One of the perks of having negative pressure is it makes it more uh, in, in line flush with the skin. So you don't have that um, sheer friction when you're turning somebody that the dressing would pop off. So I did actually initiate uh, Acticote underneath this wound. Um, so um, that, was, uh, that was due to the fact that we did, I was thinking that we had some kind of bacterial load there. So we initiated Acticote and it was bleeding quite a bit and they were concerned about that. So moving on to the next one. Um, so here, this is actually where the hip that we connected it to. 
And again, we had great success, as we said, decrease in 33% in surface area over the four weeks that we had the hip connected. Um, so super happy about that. They were super happy about that. Um, now they were actually talking about the, the other ones too, but I thought, you know, getting more than one pump in there. So, um, so we did have the Y connector on that one. So let's move on to our um, third patient here. And this is a groin abscess. So um, I, had the, I had the two pumps and I wanted to trial it again. So when I looked at this one, I had a patient, uh, a nurse call me up saying that she's got this, this wound, is draining a lot, it's causing some issues with um, yeast infection because she was draining, it's right in her groin. So she wanted to manage the moisture. So she said, hey, can we put negative pressure on that? And I'm like, okay. So we go take a look at it. It's a fairly large wound, six by three and a half, a depth of two centimeters. It was draining a lot. So I'm sure that that kind of like abscess there was still kind of draining. So we had no uh, improvement in two weeks with conventional dressing. So we looked at initiating the negative pressure. So when I was thinking of it, I didn't actually know whether or not I had to like put this pump back and get it serviced and come back. So I took a look at it. And when we're looking at it, getting ready for your next patient. So cleaning and disinfecting the pump. You do not have to send this back um, to get this done. You can do it on yourself. So basically you're gonna take out new canister in, wipe the pump down with your antiseptic wipes. Um, and then there is, it walks you right through it. So the pump had been off in my car for a couple of days. So self-testing, it automatically goes through a self-testing thing. It turns on, does a self-testing. It tells me everything is good to go. And I restored and it like walked me right through it to restore uh, default. So it actually clears your pump of any logs from previous. And now it gives you that thing saying you're ready for the new patient. I'm like, oh my God, that was super easy. So um, I didn't actually even like have to, to, to put that back in. So I'm thinking, you know, one of the reasons why um, it's so easy for us in the clinic setting to use a Pico is that often we'll keep, you know, one or two in the clinic. And if I see somebody come in, I can start them right away. So I'm thinking, wouldn't this be fantastic just to be able to have these on the shelf and be able to start patients right away, rather than having to go through the whole process of getting one ordered and cleaned and back and, and then calling for pickup. And so really nice that way. So then we're looking at um, the pump self test, which we talked about how it kind of goes through. Dave, if you want to talk a little bit uh, yeah, more yeah. about that. I can do, yes, of course. This is another Smith and Nephew innovation. And as Amanda mentioned before, you would have to send a pump away to get it between patients serviced. Now you don't do that, you check it out yourself and it guides you really easily through that. So the self-test um, is, is pretty quick. It's about 30 seconds or so to, to do that. Um, and that, that will actually prompt you to do that every two weeks or after two weeks without using the pump or every six months during use. And it will notify you when the, you switch the pump on. If you go to the next slide, you want to see the screen. So there it is there, that's the, the, that's the self-test screen. And you see that a number of things it checks out. First of all, that your user interface, which is your buttons and your display is working properly. It makes sure your battery is healthy. Oh, sorry, go back a second, please. Thank you. Um, then it, it checks the pump internally as well, make sure it flows properly, that there are no internal leaks and that the over vacuum safety cutoffs are working properly. And once it's done that, then you know that that pump is functionally good. Um, and you do this, the cleaning um, charge up and put it back on the shelf ready for the next patient. So really simple efficiency at, at every turn as well, as it says there. Okay, so like with my other um, patients that I was using, I really didn't have an option um, to go through about all this uh, troubleshooting that we had in the past. So this patient, because it was in a very difficult spot in her groin, so this is much more uh, difficult to maintain uh, your seal. So we actually had alarms go off with this patient. And um, so one of the great things was this, when the alarm went off, one of the big things is knowing why your alarm's going off. So um, the alarm went off and knowing the issue and how to troubleshoot that or for the patients to know what the issue is and to try and troubleshoot that rather than alarm going off and automatically it's a call to the nurse saying, hey, my alarm's off. And then it's the nurse trying to figure out whether she has to go and nine times out of 10, she has to go because the patient isn't able to really relay what the problem is to even for the nurse to, to be able to troubleshoot with the patient. So we did get canister full um, alarm 
and uh, this was uh, an ease of use. It actually did, and it walked you right through it. And we can show a little bit of video, I think, on the next slide. Um, so this is actually, sorry, this one, yeah. So these actually, if you take a look at those, they actually have those little photos there that go through it. So it makes it, you know, really simple to use. Now these are all kind of like, this one is for a leak. Uh, that went off and we did have a leak and she was able to troubleshoot sometimes on her leak because it actually walked them through of what to do. So I think she told me the one time her canister was loose, she had banged it or something. Um, and, or if she, if you grab it and you push the button or something. So she was able to actually fix that canister. And other times she realized it walked her through to check the drape. So that was, it's fantastic to know what the problem is and to be able to have your patients troubleshoot before they call you and or you can call them and they can read you what's happening on the screen and you can walk your patients through it and you don't always have to make that visit. That's it. These, these are actually little animations so they're, they're quite cleverly designed to get the information across to the to the user in, in the most efficient way possible and we'll try to make them really easy, easy to follow as, as Amanda has said and the great thing about we've talked about the NFC sensor so you can see in the bottom left on the, the image of the pump there's that little NFC logo you take your phone if you wish you tap that and that takes you straight to a website where you can get videos which also help you to to, to troubleshoot as well. So you've got the animations on the screen and then you've got the videos on the website. So two ways to help troubleshoot there. The pump has detected that the canister is full. When this happens, the canister full alarm will sound. If this occurs, press the help button and follow the on-screen instructions. Ensure the pump is fitted correctly and in an upright position. Pause therapy by pressing the play pause button and reattach or replace the canister. Yes, yeah, so there's an example of a video on the website that takes the, the patient through the, through the procedure. Right. Okay, so, so I, was, I, I think I'll, I'll do this slide if that's okay. Yeah. So, so this is this is um, really what we've done to, to help this pump to be designed for for our patients and for their everyday life. And um, these are some of our claims as well to make this device compact, wearable, portable. And um, uh, one of the most important things as well we've done is to try to give it a really good battery runtime. So we have 24 hours battery runtime on this device, which means it, it gives them freedom to take the device out of the home and not have to worry about recharging it. So I think we kind of like went over this slide and I don't want to go over it too much because we want to save time for questions. The clinician patient feedback, we talked about it, ease of use, proactively uh, um, was, was worked in the long-term care facility. They're able to, to troubleshoot um, and Smith and Nephew provided amazing support, even though it wasn't really needed, but they were there and it gave them that sense of, of, uh, of help. And so when there's somebody that didn't do it, the patients, it's quiet. I mean, that's one of the big things that they said. The actual just running of it is quiet. The odor is a huge thing for our patients that are mobile and going out. Um, and the fact that the, the pump is in itself worked was a big thing. So, I mean, that's negative pressure in itself. And patient was able to troubleshoot and not always have um, a nurse come in. Um, and there was uh, no pain with the application of that. Okay. That's great. So. Um... Just to summarize, Smith & Nephew's got a strong history in negative pressure wound therapy and we're continuing to innovate in this field. Uh, you asked us to develop a pump that's easier for the patient to live with, and we did that. The pump is small, it's compact, it's lightweight, it's quiet, it's got a discrete canister and a carbon filter to remove odor. You also asked us to develop a pump that's easy to use, and I think we did that too, with online tutorials and this near field comm sensor to tap. Um, and also, you asked us to develop a pump that meets operational needs. And again, we've got seamless transition from one patient to the next with less than five minutes cleaning and using the self-test to be ready for the next patient. So Smith and have developed a pump with um, your feedback to improve the technology and to deliver value for your organization 
for the clinician and for the patients. Amanda, your perspective? Um, yeah, I think that we've we've kind of covered, you know, in the last one, and I want to leave some time for the questions. So again, it, the ease of use is the biggest innovation for this, um, and it's light, it's portable, doesn't smell. Um, so those are, and, and not to mention that the negative pressure works, but yeah. Okay, thank you very much for uh, all the information that you provided this evening. And as you've been talking, there have been questions that have been coming in, and I'd like to get right into the questions with you um, so that we can make sure we get them in before the time uh, is up. Um, so the first question I'd like to ask you is, what is your opinion on the use of negative pressure wound therapy at end of life for malignant wounds? And I guess this would be for Amanda. Yeah, so I think that, again, comfort, when when, it, when you're looking at comfort for uh, end of life, so if you have malignant wounds that's draining a lot, um, then I think this is absolutely something you can look at. Cost effectiveness, you're not changing the dressings a lot. Um, it's containing the odor, which is a big thing sometimes for our malignant wounds. Um, this is sometimes where I would use um, the Curlex instead of the foam, potentially, um, with that. So you're just managing the exudate, less dressing changes. You can leave those on for, you know, three days at least. Um, I'll often leave those on for so that I'm not changing those dressings frequently. So I'm managing my odor and managing my exudate. I'm not having to disrupt the patient with dressing changes. And those are often a really big thing for our um, palliative patients. Okay, thank you, Amanda. And the next question is for you, Dave. Um, there are many different types of negative pressure wound therapy machines, and they come in different shapes and sizes. How does the size of this machine compare to other machines out there? Is it bigger? Is it smaller? About the same? So I said already, it's a bit deceptive the, the, the way the pictures look. It's right, right, a rather compact pump, even though it's got quite a lot of power to it. So it still has got the capability to run, to run a, abdominal wounds. But in terms of size, I would say um, compared to competitors, it's much smaller than the VAC Alta, for example, um, similar perhaps to the Active VAC, um, but of course with, with more power um, to handle those larger wounds. Okay, thank you. Um, what frequency of dressing change is recommended in the clinical guidelines for this device? I, I'm, I always change mine about every three days. So um, maybe um, someone can tell me if that's different, but I, for negative pressure, I do every three days. And occasionally if, if it's in a really difficult spot, um, and sometimes you may have to do it every two, occasionally for some people, I will do it every four or change it twice a week, depending on their needs. But um, the regular guideline is every three days, but okay. use your judgment call. Okay. Um, could you talk a bit about the soft port? Does it go directly over the wound or should it be tracked um, on the, if it's on the buttocks? Will the, yeah. cor will the port collapse under the pressure of the patient's weight? So just talk a little bit about the port. Yeah. So I think if you're, if you're familiar with kind of um, other traditional negative pressures where it has a plastic port to it, um, this one is actually very soft. So the, in the port itself, is like the foam so it actually just kind of sucks down it, it's actually all ends up being like the foam sucked down so it doesn't add extra pressure do i ever track it away occasionally sometimes i would um but it, you don't have to so let's say for a big coccyx ulcer or something like that i wouldn't necessarily track it away um if it was on you know somewhere where they were walking on it um potentially i would track it um but it's not something that you have to track like you would with, you know, um, some of the other ones that have the actual hard plastic track pad. Okay. And the next question is for David. Um, is there a bag that, that comes with this machine that can be used to transport it? Yes. So we, we have accessories with it. One is a, a carry bag, which includes a strap uh, and a lid over it. So it looks almost like a camera case. So it's quite good at disguising the pump if someone's out and about. Or there's just a separate carry strap which clips over the handle ends. So you have an option to hang it over your, over your shoulder. Okay. 
Um, the next question is about the adhesive, the type of adhesive used on the drape. And I don't know if Amy uh, Casson is, is there. Um, she may want to answer this. Is the drape made of an acrylic adhesive? Yes, it is. Okay, so it is made of an acrylic adhesive. Thank you, Amy. Um, the next question is about um, the, the original um, Renesis used the Curlix. Um, and they're wondering if the addition of the foam is a major change to the dressing aspect of this negative pressure wound therapy device. Is it a specific foam for this uh, negative pressure wound therapy, or can it still be used with Curlix and the soft port? Yeah, so as you saw in my one of my case studies there, I actually used a combination of both. So you can either use all Curlix or you can use all black foam, which is your typical black foam that you see in negative pressure systems. If that's not new, so their systems have been using the black foam for quite some time now. Um, so <clears throat> even their, their one, which was what back in 2015. So I think we're using currently one that's like three, three ago. So no, the black foam um, has definitely been around for a very long time. So you can either use just the Curlex, just the black, or a combination of both. Okay. Um, the next question is for the first case uh, stage four pressure injury in the community, was the client continued on negative pressure wound therapy after one week of, of treatment? And uh, they want he wants to know if it reduced the epibole on the wound edges with the use of your negative pressure wound therapy. Yeah, so he actually continued on for about three to four weeks. Um, it actually did bring down, I didn't actually have the, the follow-up with this gentleman, unfortunately. It did bring down kind of like the, because um, it's been around for a very long time. And as you saw those rolled kind of wound edges, it did flatten them out in the one section. I would have liked there was actually like um, almost like a little out jetta that you saw in there. That did not go away as of yet. So probably that would have needed to be kind of cut or what will happen is, it will eventually heal and then you'll be left with the skin tag there. So I would have requested that to be removed uh, surgically just to have that cut back. But uh, it did kind of flatten out those edges and we were seeing it coming in on the one side. And if you can see it just even after, I think the one week there, we ha we did have a little bit coming in on the side. Um, is there only black foam or do you have white and silver foams as well? Or do you oh, just... Yeah, there's only Curlex. So you have the Curlex gauze and or you have the black foam and you can use that if you're looking for um, a silver version, then you would use something like Actacoat Flex, which I've used underneath that. So Actacoat Flex, I would use underneath it um, if you would, if you're looking for an antimicrobial. Okay. And Kathy, mm -hmm. Kathy, if I may, uh, white foam is coming this fall. So white foam is coming. Okay, yes. white foam Yay. is coming this fall. <laughs> Excellent. Testing's all done. <laughs> yeah. Um, how much how much does the canister canister hold? How much uh exudate does it hold before it alarms? Sure. So so the small canister holds about 300 milliliters and it will alarm around 250 to 270 milliliters. And the large canister holds 800 milliliters. Okay, thank you. And um because we're now um on eight o'clock uh, um eastern. Um, I have one more question and I want to direct this to, to Amanda. Um, if a patient is started on negative pressure wound therapy in the, in the hospital and they're transferred out into the community, what's your experience in the transitional process from using negative pressure therapy from hospital to community to have a seamless transition for the patient? Yeah, so that often is is a is a trouble in our area, and the fact that there are two different kind of entities, and um, they um, they're they're seen separately. So it, we get what happens is if if a surgeon wants something in the hospital sent home, then we get the orders for that. Often now we've actually put it in. So if the surgeon sends it home before they're discharged, it actually goes and um, it, the orders get through and that negative pressure is automatically ordered and it's started up in the community by the nurses so I don't even have to do the assessment if we know that 
a surgeon has requested it where they fill out the assessment form right in hospital and then those supplies are sent out right away and then the nurse initiates right away and then I would follow up within a two-week period to make sure that it is still appropriate and ongoing and then the nurses have me involved if they have questions or concerns during that care. Yeah. And so as you're doing that, are there any strategies that you've had to use to um, access funding for the pro for this product? Uh, no. So in our area, we're covered for negative pressure and we haven't had the issues. I know in some areas where there's like a wait list or things like that, we have we don't have that um, those issues. Um, so we're lucky that way. Um, we, we don't have the funding issues in long term care. Funding is always kind of they're always on it about that but I still we can go through high intensity needs for for those for long-term care in Ontario okay well thank you very much I'd like to thank uh, both you uh, Amanda and David for your time this evening um, informative um, uh, we're gonna have to close now I know there are some other questions here um, and, uh, you know, if you do have any questions, um, we will be sending out a follow-up email and feel free to email office at endswalk.ca and we'll make sure that any questions that you have are forwarded to, uh, the, the, uh, folks at Smith and Nephew. And thanks to all of you for taking the time this evening to come. There's a feedback survey here, uh, through the QR code, please, uh, uh, fill it out so that, uh, we know how to do things, uh, better in the future. And uh, again, thank you to Smith and Nephew for uh, your support in this continuing education. Have a great evening, everyone.